Uh, it's about the time. Welcome everyone. In the in this is the, this is the first time we 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 in the uh, auditorium actually. So welcome everyone. Come in person, and also everyone uh, online using Zoom. Uh, so so you can see today uh, we have uh, a panel. So we have more speakers, and they are quite special speakers compared with our usual guys here. And they are all panelists, uh, practitioners, essentially. And uh, they will bring their experience and knowledge. Uh, you know, they, they, they work in the front line. So, you know, directly with, with the customers. So they will bring their experience, knowledge to us. So I encourage you guys to uh, ask questions and, uh, you know, throughout the, the, the talk. So uh, I will uh, introduce and the, the, the moderator today, as he off, and, uh, and she will introduce our uh, panelists. Uh, so uh, Ashley is, uh, actually, I, I, I first know her uh, through our, uh, the, the, the Friedman uh, Nutrition Innovation Lab, and she is a current uh, an advisor, uh, you know, for, the, for our school's nutrition entrepreneurship program. So that's what I know her and also invite her for my precision nutrition uh, course. And Ashley is a founder of, uh, also a founder for Better Nutrition Program is a company. And uh, she, you know, that, com that company provides a personalized nutrition knowledge to practitioners and, so, and also for business. And she has, uh, uh, of course, selected by, by many awards and, uh, and recognized by, by some magazines, and she also uh, published many publications for con uh, consumers and also for practitioners. And she also uh, on, on, on air in, in some TV shows. So for, without further delay, you know, I gave the floor to you. I Thank hope you. Uh, you know, we can have a, a great dialogue today. Thank great. you so much. Thank you so much for having us. Oh, we're so happy to be here. Um, one of our panelists today is actually an alum from Tufts. So uh, Dr. Spar, uh, we just are so grateful to Tufts and um, both uh, our other two, our other three panelists are all certainly aware of the great work that the School of Nutrition and the graduates uh, are doing here. So thank you so much for having us. Uh, just a rule, uh, one piece um, for anyone who is does have a question, we are going to wait and uh, address all of the questions at the end. We'll leave about 10 or 15 minutes there. This is also being recorded. So in the event that something happens, you will be able to watch it at a later point. Uh, on, on that piece. So I thought we could just very quickly move into and, and introduce ourselves. Amanda, I'm going to actually start with you. So we're kind of doing the, the hybrid uh, virtual and in-person. And I think there are a lot of school teachers that are better at this these days than I am. But why don't we go ahead and just have you introduce yourself. How long have you been in practice and, and what is your area of practice? Yes, uh, thank you for letting me join the esteemed panel here. I am sorry I'm not in person, but I'm also very happy to stream in from Western Colorado. So um, the other side of the Rockies. Um, so I am a registered dietitian. I grew up in Europe. You'll hear that a little bit in my uh, pronunciation here. But I did my uh, nutrition degree here in the United States in the mid 90s. So I would say I was trained very traditionally, conventionally, and have enjoyed um, actually following nutrition science now all the way through to the 20, 21st century cutting edge of genomic science, which embraces nutrigenetics and nutrigenomics. So my specialty is um, working with nutrigenetics and nutrigenomics in clinical practice, uh, training, uh, coaching, and mentoring clinicians around the world. It's about 55% of my time. The other 45% of my time is in innovation around the world. Um, also working with Ashley in a couple of projects, but working globally with really visionary companies and th um, thought leaders who are looking at how can we embrace genomics um, for public health, um, as well as in industry, um, restaurants, hospitals, amazing. Um, so I am um, grateful for my 25 years that uh, I met genomics at the right time. And uh, I sit, you know, bridging innovation and clinical practice. Oh, wonderful. Ayla, I'll turn it over to you to introduce yourself. Great, thank you. Um, hi, I'm Ayla Barmer. I am also a registered dietitian. I'm uh, actually based just, just north of here in uh, Concord, Massachusetts. And uh, I, I wear a few different hats. So I, um, in addition to being a registered dietitian, I'm trained in integrative and functional medicine, herbalism. Um, I am the 
owner and clinical director of Boston Functional Nutrition. So I have a private practice um, just north of here. I focus primarily on women's health and infertility. Uh, in addition, I own and operate Full Well, which is a fertility, wellness, and education brand, and have co-founded the Women's Health Nutrition Academy, which uh, aims to provide continuing education in the space of women's health for registered dietitians and also allied health practitioners. Dr. Spar. Hi, yeah, you can call me Dr. Jumbo. I'm a Jumbo, <laughs> um, but undergrad, um, and I'm an internist, board certified internal medicine, and did my medical school at University of Michigan, um, and then went on to do my residency and did a fellowship in what's called health services research, getting a master's in public health and looking at how do we improve the healthcare system. Found that that was really a very hard thing to do, and got frustrated by having been trained in only acute care medicine, really, and not really able to help about 50% of the people that came to me, which is a common theme you hear among integrative functional medicine, lifestyle medicine focused practitioners. So went and worked as a humanitarian abroad with Doctors Without Borders, where I found that there's a lot more that I could put in my toolbox from my patients and seeing how they were thriving in a way that my patients in the US weren't even before we had gotten there with our Western medicines that they certainly needed for tuberculosis and HIV. So came back really dedicated to learning what were they doing that even if they, they were impoverished that they were able to do with connections with family, with being physically active, with eating natural ingredients as opposed to processed foods because of where they lived, those things weren't available. Sought out someone named Mary Hardy, who's also a Tuftonian graduate from the medical school, who's one of the world's experts in herbal medicine, and said, you have to tell me, how do I learn more about folk medicine and herbal medicine? And I did an integrated medicine fellowship at the University of Arizona with Andy Weil. And what's the science to integrative medicine, which is basically the same as lifestyle medicine and functional medicine. Um, from there, focused on doing that in underserved settings as well as with men, because men are kind of underserved in integrative medicine because they don't seek care and we need to really work hard to reach out to them. So I've really dedicated my career to accessible integrative medicine. I'm the chair of the American Board of Integrative Medicine. We're now a board certified field. As a physician, you can be board certified in integrative medicine. And um, I'm a national medical director of a company that does men's health nationally um, using all different kinds of techniques. Lara. Well, I certainly can relate to that story. Um, so I started out as a pharmacist, pretty conventionally trained, worked in community pharmacy, and similarly got frustrated with seeing uh, essentially the burden of disease continue to get worse, despite the fact that folks were, you know, we we're doing a pretty good job keeping them compliant on medication. Um, so it's been about probably 15 years that I slowly started to inch toward integrative medicine. I fell in love with nutrition and decided to go back and train as a nutritionist and uh, since then have also dabbled in medicinal um, herbalism. I've dabbled in pharmacogenomics, nutrigenomics and public health. And actually similarly uh, uh, worked with a uh, nonprofit that was focused on the Syria crisis, started doing that right around 2015 and started noticing um, essentially that in crisis situations, particularly non-communicable diseases, don't get addressed. And you're starting to see some of that disparity as well in the United States, even though we have been trying to focus on prevention. But where I think um, I got drawn in was how do we leverage that information from a public health perspective? How do we scale what we know in terms of integrative medicine, what we know can work on a one-to-one -one, and how do we make that fit on a larger global scale potentially? Wonderful. Well, gosh, you guys are all such great people. Um, around the time you all were in school figuring out how to help people uh, and, and be make the world a better place, I was figuring out how to sell sugared cereals um, to America and around the world. So my first professional foray outside of um, uh, uh, once I finished at, at Duke, where I uh, figured out how to sell uh, advertising for Duke to, in UNC. Uh, so there was, if anyone knows about the Duke UNC, you can always see I was <laughs> loved selling things. Um, and I bring that up because selling sugared cereals actually taught me almost everything that we need to know today about what we aren't doing in healthcare and what we need to be doing in healthcare. We have to make things deliciously doable. We have to make them entertaining. We have to make them 
approachable. We have to make them affordable. Uh, and I did ultimately pivot very quickly from selling sugared cereals to what I am doing today. Um, but I bring that up because as we move into this conversation today and why we wanted to talk about this and why it was so important to me when we agreed on the topic of personalized nutrition that I brought you practitioners. The P in personalized, in our opinion, really does, at least in my opinion, I'll let the, the individuals, uh, the panelists share, really does stand for practitioner or even practitioner patient relationship. And one of the things that I see so much today, we all see, is how much personalization is actually being sold. Where we are today in 2022 is not where we were when I became a practitioner and you know, at the, the turn of the century. We know today that, that healthcare needs to be personalized, that even if you're a, a woman who is the same age, you don't necessarily have the, the same needs as somebody else. Um, and even if you are, uh, even for yourself, you don't have the same needs throughout the year, throughout the seasons, et cetera. So when it comes to personalization, it is what everybody wants. And I will tell you from my sugar cereal days, what everybody wants is what companies sell. And so what is happening is we're seeing the cell of personalized nutrition. We're seeing the cell of personalized medicine. And in that cell, we're, what is unfortunately happening is we're not seeing it play through and actually getting those better outcomes. So I wanna pose to the panel, I shared with, this, uh, with them ahead of time, so I've had a moment to prepare. I want to ask the question of, you know, really, what is personalized nutrition and what is it not? And if you can give me an example that, it, you know, specific to your practice or your practice area, that, that I think would be a great place for us to start. Um, so I'm going to pick on you, Dr. Spar, because you're looking at me. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think you'll find that personalized nutrition or personalized medicine in general is being touted a lot by practitioners because it's a buzz phrase. But what you really end up seeing for the most part are products looking to use that terminology to be sold when they're not really authentically personalized to the individual, they're personalized to groups of people. Like Ashley was saying, like they will have, for example, in men's health, you'll have these executive physicals that purport to be personalized and delivering unique plans for every patient when really they have about three different plans and they will say, yes, it's personalized because I will decide which of these three plans is right for you. Should you have an intermittent fasting diet? Should you, depending on your goals and depending on your workout routine, or should you be on a keto diet or should you be on, you know, a FODMAPS diet if you have G issues or GI issues or whatever, but they don't actually really look at that individual and say like what, what we do in my practice, what are your specific goals? What are your risk factors based on your personal health history, your family medical history, genomics like Amanda does and what's going on in your life right now? Like Ashley very importantly said, even for you right now, that's very different from you three months from now and what you should be eating, what supplements you should be taking. So we have the, we have the technology to actually know that. It's such an exciting time to be practicing yet most of these companies aren't taking advantage of the diagnostics and the very individualized risk assessments they can be doing to help target those to individuals. Oh, I love that. And one day, I, I, I this happens on the regular. Um, I'm lucky to have all of these as these individuals as colleagues and friends. But one day, I sent Amanda very early her time. Can you believe this? There's a DNA test that from your DNA results, they're now selling you supplements, like as if you just get the results back and um, voila, like here's a blueprint to who you are as an individual. Now let's just go, you know, take a methylfolate and call me in a few years. Um, that's definitely not personalization. So Amanda, I'm going to come over to you uh, with that introduction. We talk about this quite frequently. What's personalized uh, and what is not and through the lens of, of what you're, the work that you're doing? Right. And you know what? I actually, in preparate, preparing for this, I actually wrote this out. And, you know, we all, all of us here speak all over the place. And it's rare that we would read our notes, but I'm reading them. Okay, you can watch me on this stage. I'm going to read because I wanted, I don't want to miss these points. So I'm, you know, jumping on a piggyback from what Miles said. So here I go. We've experienced, because this is a, you know, it's a great forum to talk and we have experienced many iterations of nutrition science in both the one-on-one -on -one and public health space. And public health, you know what, personalized or what nutrition is nothing if it is not accessible to everyone around the world, period. I mean, it just, that, that has been a foundation of my career. And I think it doesn't matter what the advances are in medicine, nutrition and medicine, if they're not accessible to all, they're not successful. So I feel very strongly about that. So. We've gone in nutrition science from generalized to what is considered personalized. 
uh, and now to genomically driven intervention. In personalized, we may include their, you know, functional nutrition and medicine. So for me, personalized truly means that the solutions are paired with the unique building blocks of an individual. And DNA is actually the formula for the human body. So genomics to me has and will remove the guesswork. So case in point for me, having been also trained in functional nutrition, I can run an advanced lab test reflecting organic acids or a state of metabolic intermediate. So in the Krebs cycle at any point in time, I can choose what I feel are the right supplements and hopefully food, tongue in cheek. <laughs> and if the repeat values don't shift, did I choose the right building block intervention? Did I get it right? Because as Miles said, and we all agree, we are different from day to day to day. So when we're using testing at a point in time, it is a snapshot of a point in time, right? So, so have we really gotten to the foundation? So personal, to answer your question, personalized medicine to me begins with the signposts from gene information that reflects a gene picture from a systems approach. This form of information is a mirror of our internal operating system and where, and really shows us where the efficiencies and inefficiencies lie in our biochemistry. Biochemistry is the human operating system, okay? When you pair a genomic blueprint with a patient history and story, you start to hone in on where the breaks, casualties, inefficiencies are in the system, and you work there first. So you have a whole system, a blueprint in front of you that you pair with a patient and that uh, the patient's story and circumstances. And from there, you can start to uh, really prioritize where you want to start. So for me, genomics stops you from throwing mud at a system or supporting supplements without, preci first, preci without first precision validating the need. There's no point, for example, in fixing blood sugar dysregulation when the actual driver of dysregulation is reactive oxygen species that come from the immune system. Right, So it, there's no point in trying to fix the end of the road when the problems are upstream. There's no point in giving someone a taurine supplement um, to, you know, make, to facilitate better biosynthesis when the problem is upstream and you haven't fixed the system that allows the body to produce taurine to facilitate biosynthesis. So in other words, we're jumping in too often in personalized nutrition too far down the road, instead of looking at upstream and saying, where are the inefficiencies upstream in the neighborhood of the body? We fix that first. That truly is personalized nutrition because we're, we're kind of looking at the whole map and looking where we get the best return on ingestion or and investment from food or supplementation. That's what genomics actually does for us. It gives us the roadmap, along with the training with the clinician, to get to where the inefficiencies are first. When you fix the inefficiencies, the whole system can come back online, the cellular level, the systems level, the functional level, and the health level. So to me, that's what precision nutrition is, and that's the space I'm working in. Uh, so po so powerful, and you'll note that I did a little running around. So, Ayla, I'm going to ask you a question, and when you when I do, just turn turn your mic back on. Uh, just when Amanda's speaking, we'll we'll turn those off. Um, so that that example is so profound, and I think maybe people who don't have experience with genomics yet are thinking like, I don't even necessarily understand or know the ups the upstream, or maybe those that like me ditched science drive and said, you know, I was I wasn't going to do that uh, until later. Um, but Ayla actually, uh, in working with her, gave me one of my, what has turned out to be my favorite. And I think truly like such a pragmatic and also disruptive example of where personalization is going so wrong. So um, just, and we have a few audience members, um, but just raise your hands if you have ever heard, you know, if you're a vegan, you need B12, or if you have a low iron on a lab test, you need to take an iron supplement. Okay, so everyone in the audience here at Tufts School of Nutrition is raising their hand. And what we're seeing on that part is that is actually not personalized. Um, and in deciding to, not just as a practitioner in her, her education work, but also now as uh, someone who has a, a, a supplement and an education company, deciding to really look at and teach us about personalized iron, uh, you might think of like, what is that? And so Ayla, let's, let's take it away on that part. It just moves it up, I think.
There we go. Okay. I got it. We'll I got it. Back. We'll come back and start <laughs> off on that one. Sorry, everyone. We're navigating. Not quite having Amanda sound balance. If you don't mind, we'll just start over again. On Okay, sure. So, uh, yeah, just uh, I just wanted to acknowledge I, I completely agree with my colleague Amanda uh, here. Her and I both get really excited about, you know, the biochemistry and getting into the, the pathways. And it's just important. Um, I think we've got so many tools available now and advances in technology between the data we can get from wearables, um, which I, I think it's really interesting. Everyone on the panel, we've all got wearables on right now between, you know, aura rings and whoops and all the rest. Um, you know, and, and all these new biomarkers and genetic testing and things that we can pull in that can really help us personalize, but we can't forget, you know, the person in front of us and looking at their, their specific data. And I think um, as Ashley started to uh, talk about is, uh, you know, in women's health, a real specific nutrient of concern that I think illustrates where things can get very generalized and not personalized is with iron. Um, so iron is, is uh, you know, a tricky nutrient. There's a delicate balance for it. And when it comes to women, which by the way, women are very underrepresented in the research, um, you know, we're, you know, 50% of the, the population, but in research studies, uh, through, you know, historically and even currently, very small percentage of actual studies um, being done on women. So, um, or at least there are a smaller percentage of the population being tested. So, um, you know, when it comes to, when it comes to iron, the, that's, that's something that needs to really be looked at on the individual level, matched to the lab results, not just given as a blanket recommendation because you're a woman in a certain stage of life, pregnancy is a good example. It is an extremely important nutrient, but if you don't have the lab, uh, the, the lab data in front of you, if you don't have assessment on dietary intake, if you don't understand not only what their intake looks like, but are they are they absorbing and utilizing, you know, this nutrient, then it becomes really difficult to um, to to give an appropriate recommendation around iron. And the risk there is that you know, with giving a blanket recommendation is that we're gonna to go too high, uh, you know, and that risks oxidative stress that um, can be problematic. So this is a, a, a nutrient that really does need to come in delicate balance or we go too low and then that creates a number of risk factors. So I know that's a very specific example, but I think iron kind of highlights the need for we can't just simply say, based on the research, we want to prescribe all women of childbearing age or all pregnant women a certain dose of iron. You know, uh, we really need to look at the individual and do a better job at tracking and, and measuring using all of these great tools that we have available now um, to, to do that. Yeah, so helpful. So another one that I am uh, can often, everybody here I text and send them my, I can't believe I just saw this on social media or whatever. Um, and then I usually will find them on my social, I'll, I'll post them on my social media, some version of a health hall of shame. And I recall uh, sharing over to Lara one just recently that I saw that was this great ad uh, for a company. It's on, it's on my site. I own everything that I, I'm happy to say this. I'm not going to disclose the company, but if you want to check it out, uh, it was, hey, do you have these, um, do you are you, are you have hives? Are you itchy? Or do you have GI issues? You know, whatever. Maybe you have food allergies or intolerances. Great. Good question to actually be asking. The next one was, uh, we have uh, over 20 tests for you. Great. The next slide was no doctor required. Interesting. Um, there was no slide that followed that said no nutritionist, pharmacist, or anyone trained in the, on the nutrition side involved, but I would have liked to have seen that in there as well. Uh, and then the next one was uh, just pick a test and you'll get easy, fast results. We'll show you what foods to, what you need to get rid of, what you need to include, you know, whatever on that part, but it was easy, fast results. And I just, you know, hand in head, just what, what are we doing here, right? Because every one of us is, our practices have been a revolving door for people like all, all of ourselves who have spent money on tests like that, where, um, and then typically, you know, if you are have a system, if you're allergic, if you are, have a very irritated digestive system, what you're currently eating, that's going to show up as what is irritating your system. The only thing you've done is paid a lot of money to get information that you already know, which is you have an irritated system. So, and then the fact that there are 20 tests, it's kind of shooting you in this whole area. And this company is designed to just sell more tests. Interesting on that part. So I sent it over to Lara and I was like, I mean, here's job security for us, unfortunately. Um, but in terms of outcomes, we know that we need to be doing better. So Lara, you have such an interesting background, both as a pharmacist and as a nutrition practitioner. Um, personalized, not personalized. You know, we've talked about these testing. Take it away on that part. So I, I went from dispensing um, medication to dispensing broccoli. 
<laughs> um, and in that transition, I learned quite a few things. Um, so to, to the point that you're making, you're seeing this a lot, right? Like we're seeing these ads for these companies that are selling, uh, whether it be food sensitivity testing, uh, microbiome testing, uh, you, you have it, right? And they will from there prescribe for you, this is gonna be your optimal ideal diet, right? And there's a couple of really great points that have been made so far. You know, the fact that if it's not scalable and accessible, then it's not really going to be useful. The fact that it has to be um, bio-individualized, um, the fact that you brought up the life cycle, right? Uh, the fact that we brought up specific genetics and what's turned up and what's turned down and really being being able to get there sort of with, with a precision instrument to understand what to focus on and maybe what to ease up on. Then there's this other layer too that is what else is happening in the environment? Your microbiome, a whole other host a ecological system that's living on you and in you and within you that is also influencing these outcomes. I'll piggyback on the iron example. I had a, happens to be female patient who has been anemic for 20 plus years, has never been able to get her ferritin and iron levels up into target range. Um, turns out that she's had this significant dysbiosis issue. And once that was addressed, corrected, her iron shot back up and we had to ease her off of the iron supplement. So here's somebody that in theory needed supplementation. We're optimizing supplementation, maybe at first not, but you know, kept playing around with dosage and dosage forms, did that layer. And now once we address the microbiome, boop, everything else goes back into place. So at some point, the human body is not meant to just follow the instructions. It's reacting to the environment around it. And again, to this microbiome piece that's impacting its epigenetic expression on top of what the hardware is already set to do. So there's that really important piece. And then if you just, at this point in the game, just give that information, give recommendations out, and you don't do the assessment part, you don't follow up and see if you need to change the plan at any point. As this woman never got in her iron levels checked, she'd probably be overloading on iron, would create a whole other oxidative stress mitochondrial issue, right? And so that piece of where no one gets the follow-up, that they just assume, oh, my test said I'm not allowed to have, I don't know, apples or whatever. And then they'll come to me, I don't know, 15 years later with SIBO. <laughs> right, right. And they're like, well, I don't eat apples because this one test that I took this one time told me that I can't have apples. And I'm like, well, okay, well, let's work on that now, right? So at what point does it shift to putting the onus, the burden on the individual to make the decision? And at what point is clinician intervention needed to really come in there with precision to really start driving the conversation? Maybe one day we'll get to the point where the algorithms can start to come in, but that has to be guided by clinicians, I think, at this stage in the game. Uh, so powerful. Um, just because of our sound factor, what I'm going to do is, Amanda, I'm going to ask uh, you a uh, couple of questions. I want to move to a little bit of forward thinking, and then we're going to open this up to questions. So please feel free to put any questions. We've covered a lot of territory in a very short amount of time. Um, please feel free to put any of your questions into the chat box. But I want us to, um, this panel is the perfect one for thinking a little bit uh, future forward. Um, what are we going to be seeing and maybe when in terms of what's beneficial? So we're not, um, despite how it might sound, and I'll say this certainly on my side, we're not anti everything that's going on. You know, we, we're excited about it. So what could be beneficial? What do we see that can be problematic in the direction of where we're going? Uh, and then we'll also just um, ask about uh, if you were an investor, if you were looking to either invest or for our students here, if you're looking to go into, you know, where, where do we think is that area that we should invest either our resources or our energy and efforts. So what I'm going to do is just change this up a little bit. I'll come back to the panel in a moment, but if we can all turn our microphones off. And Amanda, that includes me turning mine off. And so I'm just going to have you go ahead and answer, give some thoughts to that uh, for the next couple of minutes, and then I'll come back to the panel. Um, okay, so just post the question again, the, the question you want me to answer again, Ashley. Sure, and I actually gave you four at one time. Right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> just, just forward thinking. Um, you know, what, what do you, we, what do you think we will be seeing, and maybe when? So maybe is it, you know, ten years, fifty years from now that we think is actually beneficial? You know, as we, as we're like, I'm so happy in 2022 that there's this emphasis on personalization that I wanted to see in 2000. So kind of forward thinking. You know, what, what will we see? What are, what are you concerned about? You know, in the same time frame, like as, as we're forward thinking, and then. 
for the students that are here, for the investors that might be listening, for people who are thinking about where, where should I focus my efforts? Where, where would you see, what would you recommend? So maybe we'll make it three questions in that. Yeah, way. yeah, and you'll have to come back to me if I don't keep them in order. So I think the rate limiting step right now is um, conventional thinking in turf wars in nutrition and medical science. Uh, I'll be honest that, um, you know, uh, industry, the private sector and universities are moving forward uh, with genomic science. You know, all you have to do is follow Wall Street uh, and you're gonna see where these investment capsules are. So it is imperative um, at the university academic level and those of you who may be graduating, and I know Tufts has an absolutely amazing um, uh, faculty in uh, nutrigenomics research, it is imperative that we prepare our future practitioners with the tools of the trade, which is in nutrigenetics and nutrigenomics, which pairs with science. You know, it is absolutely critical. And let me just be uh, really clear here. So my company is The Genomic Kitchen. I founded the company. Yes, I work in the cutting edge of DNA testing, but the company was built to bring the concepts of nutrigenomics into the public health space. In other words, we can teach individuals um, across the nation, across the world, how to choose food based on how they talk to our genes. It's called nutrigenomics and you don't need to test to validate nutrigenomics because nutrigenomics is using bioactives that are resident in food um, to initiate cell signaling. In other words, we can, for those of you who know, may not be familiar with the field, we literally can arm the grocery cart now with very specific foods that do the in innate, the job of informing the innate intelligence of the body. So understanding nutrigenetics and nutrigenomics can totally change the public health sector. We can be talking not about pyramids and plates, but about the power of crucifers and how to work with your genes if, if you know, you're a super taster. So this is a complete switch in nutrition science. But when we also think of cutting edge, what's gonna prevent this is territorial wars, wanting to keep the food label the way it is, wanting to stay in um, kind of silo thinking. When we know in innovation in science that nutrigenetics and nutrigenomics is going to be out there regardless. Uh, and I think to your point, um, Ashley, and we kind of know this in some of our work, AI is out there, you know, artificial intelligence. I don't think, um, given the different testing companies we're looking at, uh, um, that they are able to kick out algorithms yet, just the way the, the tests are built. Um, but the innovation is there that we can actually learn from, probably now from um, targeted groups, cohorts within companies, what a workforce looks like. In other words, we're not guessing that 40% of the individuals that are working in your company um, may have issues with insulin insufficiency. Uh, we actually know it without revealing any names. So my gosh, here we are using artificial intelligence, potentially it's not there yet, to change the workspace, the cafeteria, the kind of um, one-to-one uh, -one intervention you may have physician or nurse practitioner whatever in those um, companies so this is where science going this is where we can totally inform the public sector where we can change the workspace and for goodness sake change the health picture of um, humans around the world so um, so rate limiting step territory wars conventional thinking doing the things the way they are well guess what innovation is out the gate Wall Street's got it. Some of us were early adopters, this panel, early adopters. We know that this is where it's going. So if you haven't jumped on the train, my absolute uh, recommendation is to do it. You know, when you graduate or, you know, keep asking about it in, in the universities, if you're at Tufts or wherever, please make sure we get this on medical curriculums and health curriculums. It is important because it's a game changer. It is. Did I answer all the questions? <laughs> um, you, did, you did awesome. I'm going to have our panelists uh, turn their mics back on and thank you. And I'll, I'll put you, I'll have you pause there. Uh, we'll ask some of these questions and then we'll open things up to uh, the Q and A in which, and I'll, I'll give you some instructions, Amanda, on how, how we'll handle the, the mic there. Um, thank you. That was great. 
Um, and gosh, it makes me think so many things, especially that I now eat beets on the regular, thanks to Lara and Amanda in terms of from a genetic standpoint. Um, and it's really interesting, you know, when you start to think about, and I also am decaf as opposed to caffeinated, and actually feel better as a result of both, even though those were substantively challenging things for me to do. And it was, it, but the personalized, because they could speak to me in a personalized way, it really helped me to understand how it was going to help me achieve my health goals. So, so much opportunity, uh, as you were talking about. Ayla, I want to uh, bring it over to you. Um, you know, you're sitting here. So on the one hand, we've been talking a lot about the supplement space, like, oh gosh, you know, all of these negatives, right? On that part. And as somebody who has a company where you, you know, you, you, you know that intimately well. But I'm also struck too that one of the places that needs so much attention from a personalization standpoint is fertility. Uh, and in particular, would love for you to share a little bit too about how. Um, it's just not the ladies. <laughs> so, and I think that's, you know, you and Dr. Spar may uh, both enjoy talking a little bit about that. So thinking about, uh, thinking forward thinking, what, uh, what are you optimistic about you know, that we can be seeing that will be helpful for us? And, and what do you see as some of those challenges? Yeah, you know, yeah, when it comes to fertility, which much of my work over the past 15 years has been in that space, um, I, I'm really excited about moving into preventing fertility issues, getting ahead of the problem before, um, before, you know, couples wind up in a system where they're being treated and it winds up being a very physically, emotionally, financially taxing, uh, process on something that is a deeply personal journey, you know, for many. And so I think there's, there is endless opportunity right now in the fertility space to improve how we're addressing, how we're talking about how we're treating and how we're how we're really addressing and approaching fertility. I'm, I'm excited about what, uh, similar to what Amanda had said, what we can get from aggregate data. Um, I know personal privacy is always uh, at the, the forefront of a lot of those conversations, but I think there's a lot that we can learn about um, from aggregate data coming from uh, some of the, the testing that's being done from wearable devices that can help us kind of identify some of the key, and we already know we have good data around some of the key steps that individuals can take to really protect and improve their fertility. And that really goes so far beyond just uh, conceiving, like getting a positive pregnancy test. I mean, we're talking about epigenetic, you know, uh, changes, influences that happen throughout a pregnancy that affect generations, you know, so if we want to think about the health of future generations, multiple down the road, we do need to start thinking about preconception health now. So this is before pregnancy, which typically the signal to make a lot of health changes is when uh, a woman does get pregnant, right? Um, and so in men are often left entirely out of the picture altogether. And um, we have even more exciting research now that's showing, you know, paternal, paternal health preconception is actually influencing pregnancy complications that we once or we still really put on a woman's shoulders, you know, and it affects both mom and baby over the long term. So this is, um, it's, fertility is a really exciting space that I'm really glad to be a part of. Um, I think in addition to the aggregate data, and I think this is possible in a much shorter time frame. I would love to see things like um, there's cycle tracking apps. There's now it's very easy to track um, metabolic metabolism markers like basal body temperature and heart rate that can give a lot of insight, you know, especially for me as a practitioner into what's going on with someone's hormones, um, metabolism and reproductive health are reciprocally regulated. So they talk to each other and, um, you know, so I, I'm excited about make, having tools that make it easier for um, individuals who are now, you know, most people are, are tracking some sort of health data, right? I mean, it's very common, whether it's on a phone, you know, an Apple watch, an aura ring, you know, whatever. And, um, you know, when I see someone in the office, you know, I want them to be able to very easily share that data with me. And right now it's, it's painful, <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> we're taking screenshots on the phone and they're, they're giving me their phone and I'm, you know, I'm looking at it and now virtually it's like, it's, it's even more difficult. So, um, you know, I would personally love to see, um, some of these companies that are helping individuals gather such key, really important data, make it easier for practitioners to, to collaborate with the individual to help them move the needle on their, their health um, as well. Oh, I think that's so powerful. And uh, from the earliest conversations with Dr. Spar, it was, um, yes, and that's great information, Ashley, but a guy doesn't think about it that way. <laughs> and so I think, you know, as you were talking, as Ayla was talking about 
Um, number one, women being underrepresented in research studies. Um, what Dr. Spar has done for me and, and to such great extent at the national level has really awakened us to the reality that the communications a lot of times, especially in the nutrition space are so female oriented, right? And really focused on, um, uh, are you going to keep a food journal as we were talking about, you know, what are you gonna track? And at the same time, men may enjoy data collection, you know, in some of these pieces. So I'm curious what you as sort of through the lens of, of thinking about uh, the male um, as our male who is here, uh, um, what, what are your thoughts on where things are going that on the positive and, and what may challenge us? Sure, I think we're, we are at the most exciting time to be practicing in the healthcare field that there's ever been. We really are, but we're also not where we need to be. We have the testing, we have the nutrigenomic testing that Amanda's talking about, and we have all the data elements that Ayla's talking about. We thought there would be an army of practitioners ready to help patients use this data. We, we aren't there. From nutritionists, from RDs, RNs, advanced practice clinicians, physicians, physical therapists, chiropractors, that army hasn't materialized nearly enough. And so that's why these companies are doing these direct-to-consumer sales, bypassing all of us. And how do you teach an individual without any kind of health knowledge, precision medicine, how to really utilize those results? So I think the first thing we really need, and especially talking about with men's health, is someone to help translate all this great data we can get, not only from wearables, but looking at micronutrient testing, food sensitivity testing, stool testing, microbiome testing, as well as the genetic and testing to know what foods would help turn on and off the right genes from that nutrigenomic standpoint. So we need to, to really be well-versed in how to use all this new data that we can now get. And then the other thing I think that we need to be doing is what Ayla was just touching on, yeah, I like the aggregate data, but what you were saying about what do you do with your individual data, we need the technology <laughs> to utilize N of one studies across the board. Because if we're talking about precision medicine, we're talking about individualized medicine by definition. So we can't have studies of 500 people and try and exclude everybody that is um, that are outliers, because that's currently what we do. If we're talking about precision medicine, we need to have a way, so we need the technology and the engineers to build ways to analyze 500 different people doing 500 different interventions with 500 different sets of results. And what can we learn from that? So what we call N of one studies. To me, that's the future of precision medicine. And that's where we need to be going. So first we need to have these practitioners trained to be able to do that. And then we need to be able to have the technology and the artificial intelligence to be able to figure out how do you compile a completely crazy database like that to decide, okay, now I get it. If the biome is showing this and their aura ring is showing that, then the food sensitivity doesn't matter. They're stressed out and they're totally dysbiomic. So I don't care that it shows they have a ton of IgGs to almonds and everything else. That isn't the issue. Like Ashley was alluding to, the issue is their gut is sick and they're stressed out versus somebody else who is doing the same test but has slightly different results. No, they're really sensitive to almonds and they can't eat almonds. And so at that, to me, that's the future. And when you're talking about guys, they want data or people who think like a stereotypical guy. Mm -hmm. So they need data and they need, the only other thing I'll add is if you are gonna be working with people who think like a stereotypical male, it's one or two things at a time. It's not giving them a bunch of different things, track a bunch of things, but just have them do one intervention at a time and see how that affects them personally. Yeah, I love that. And I do want to acknowledge too the role of health coaches um, and practitioners who, like myself, trained as a dietitian. I if I today, if I was if I had not moved over to do the better nutrition program in my practice, I probably probably also would have gotten uh, certified as a coach. So that ability to actually help somebody uh, connect them um, when we were listing out the practitioners, just want to make sure we we, we include them yes. in the mix. Sorry, you're right. um, Ashley, so yes. Ashley, can I ask? Sorry, I know you have to turn your mics off. Sorry to be uh, goofy here. Um, so what Dr. Spar talked about was so two really, really important things. We do not have an army of clinicians. You'd think, you know, that we would be ready to go. This is the best time in nutrition and medicine we've ever seen. You know, with the Human Genome Project gave us the, 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 the facility capacity to understand how the human body is built. It's brilliant. 
And that dictates so much of how we're understanding how to work with individuals. So um, you're right, globally around the world, we cannot train clinicians fast enough. This is hard work, which is why we want to see it in universities because it's about pattern recognition. It's a way of thinking. It's like, yeah, I can say like being a mathematician, it isn't. So it's a really, really important point that we have got to get a global army of clinicians trained, which starts at the university level. Some of us, are, and Ashley and I work on a very innovative project to look at this field um, to create a lower barrier to entry, but that's a whole other, that's a whole other conversation. But Miles, what you said, I was taught by, I feel like some of the best mentored by some of the best in the world in this field. And the one thing they've been saying since 2015 is we have to publish N of one data. You know, this, the model for understanding uh, these changes now is not the epi not the pharmaceutical lot model. It's our the epidemiological model. It's an N of one model. And my gosh, we had this conversation at the University of Colorado about three years ago. And it is monumental to think how to do this. You know, it requires some brilliant brains to think of the technology to and bring Amanda, in all the I'm gonna I, a thousand. I'm gonna cut you off because this is where I want to go. You're leading the witness brilliantly, which as our conversations are want to do. That's where I'm going over to Lara on that point. So let's do that and, and then we'll get to the questions. Um, I'll just have you mute for a minute. And, and Lara, one of the reasons as we were talking about coaches, I wanted to incorporate in coaches is that, you know, I, I consistently, one of the areas of invention, um, incredible resource allocation, you know, we see what Mark Cuban has done and others is how can we make it easier for people to get their medications? How can we make it more affordable for them to get their medications? How can we um, help them remember to take their medications? And pharmacists, are trained and they're trained in nutrition and they're trained at that point to have those conversations. And yet so many of them, and you and I have had this conversation, are not able to pull out and be actually in, empowered in that space to do anything more than say, here is your prescription, you know, and here's this piece. So I wanted to come to you because I think there's so much opportunity. I mean, we talk about it all the time, so much opportunity in this space to have pharma and pharmacists have a very different meaning, but also we, we still have some challenges there, you know, within that. So go ahead, Lara. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great, um, that's a great question. So, I, I, you know, the conversation as it's evolving um, is reminding me of when I was starting out in pharmacy school 20 something years ago. Um, and I remember we were on the precipice of the, the genome project. And the idea was that once we, when, once we got all our ducks in a row, we would be able to get in there and tell people specifically what med medications they can or can't take, right? And it was focused on pharma because that was where a lot of the funding was coming from. And that was sort of where the, the wave of medicine was going. And we were wrong. We, we, you know, all the, the the pharmacogenomics that we studied during that era uh, wasn't incorrect. The data is accurate. However, we weren't able to translate that into a way that really allowed us to precisely prescribe medications for people. Um, some of the data is like 20 something years old and it is still not being useful. And that has a lot to do with the fact that to the point that you made, Miles, there's no way to really make it practical for a clinician, right? And it starts at, if anyone has ever used an EHR or an EMR system, it starts at that, the fact that they are not integrated well, the fact that there's not a shared communication, the fact that it's not easy for you to just show somebody what your data is. And here are my genetics. And can you use that to help prescribe a medication? Or can the pharmacist then help to navigate which medication we should or shouldn't be using. So again, the there's a technology gap that has not caught up to the research gap. I, I mean, you could, you could start to parse that apart and say maybe some of the research was maybe focused in the wrong area. Fine. But at the end of the day, if you are trying to scale something and the technology has not caught up and your clinicians have not caught up, the, 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 the research itself is not going to really help us get anywhere. It has to be applicable in a clinical setting in a way that takes into account all the different variables of the people that you're taking into consideration. And that's why everybody's talking about these NF1 models. Essentially what you're trying to catch are the people, the outliers that either haven't been studied or are the, that, that, that tail end of your bell curve and why didn't it work on those people. And so of course, a model that's trying to focus on the center of that bell curve is not gonna work. And so I think where it starts 
isn't trying to rehash how we do our literature evaluation, how we do our reviews, how do we take those NN1 models and make them applicable so that we can actually extrapolate data that's applicable clinically. And I think from there, we look at the force of clinicians that we have. I think pharmacists are some of the most underutilized advanced practicing clinicians that are out there. We don't necessarily have, you, you, you know, we do have some training in nutrition. It's obviously not as extensive as those are in dietetic programs or nutrition programs. However, we are trained to use, um, to use the, the, to, to work with, with our patients to um, personalize and customize their experience, to, to counsel them on proper uh, medication, uh, to timing, interactions, uh, nutrient drug interactions, herbal uh, interactions, et cetera. So why not start with the clinician base that we have? Why not start to integrate into continuing education programs that are required already of these clinicians, more of these approaches? Why not start to give them more tools? Let's have some of the EMR start to talk to each other so that we can have more tools that we can start crossing over and having communication in between disciplines. And I think when you start to kind of reframe the conversation around access to information versus um, that direct to consumer, it changes the conversation. Now you've got physicians, pharmacists, RDs, coaches, et cetera, that are now having the same conversation versus, um, you know, maybe one arm is not as caught up with the, with the recent trends versus another one that maybe is starting to mm. talk about something else. Um, and then a consumer that is lost in it starts to lose confidence in their clinicians because they're not caught up on the latest research and starts to explore how they're going to then take ownership of their health. And on one hand, that is so empowering to be able to say, I got this test. It told me I could do X, Y, Z. And if I did this, I'm going to live to be 175 years old, <laughs> right? That's so empowering. And I want that. I want that eventually to be where we can get. But again, it's a fulcrum. And at what point does the personal responsibility of taking ownership of your health, where does it stop? Currently, it stops in disease management. But now we are seeing that we have to shift the fulcrum so that they're, so that we're not thinking of disease management, we're thinking of disease prevention. And I think that's where the integrative practitioners really have, have to really step into that. Oh, I love it. Okay, so we are going to move into a, a question and answer. I wanna recap a little of what we have learned and invite any of our guests that are here, if you would like to come up to the microphone to ask a question, otherwise, um, I will be, I've seen, I see some questions in the chat box that I'll be uh, relaying to our, our practitioners as well. Um, but just to quickly recap, so we started off the conversation around personalized medicine, personalized nutrition today, hopefully to give you a lens, um, number one, to evaluate the essential role of the practitioner in personalization. So that should also give you a, a, a way to evaluate, um, is there a practitioner? I like to think of a dartboard. Um, so if you play darts like me and you don't actually hit on the dartboard, that's where a lot of us are getting our nutrition information, we really want to try to get closer to the bullseye. The way you get there is with somebody who actually knows you, right? So is somebody interacting in this process to give you a recommendation that actually knows who you are today? That's what we mean by personalization. So that's different than the marketing of personalization and, and the selling on that part. So that was a key piece. We also heard today some very specific examples about areas of opportunity like genomics and understanding your genes uh, and the fact that our genes, there are foods that actually speak to our genes and being able to explore that, but also the risk associated with not having practitioners that don't understand how to do that or companies direct to consumer who may, or practitioners who may just take a test and sell people on supplements and how that is going to be ineffective or sell them on a, you know, a meal plan or you know, anything else uh, within that space. And then really the importance of communication uh, at every step of the way in here from a personalization standpoint to keep coming back uh, to Dr. Spar's point to not overwhelm an individual in particular men or those of us that think like them with too many things to do at once. I might just say that's all of us, like we should actually be trying to do less at once on, you know, on, on that part um, and how it can be empowering. And then I think we're in, what we also heard is we're really in a challenging spot today, which is that um, you know, practitioners are really burnt out. You know, that, that is a crisis that, you know, we, we as individuals all suffer from infobesity, too much information. Practitioners are just overwhelmed with information overload and with the challenges associated with healthcare, e navigating EMRs, et cetera. But that to Amanda's point, this is such an incredible time to become a practitioner. So for anyone who's been kind of debating or saying, hey, instead of becoming a practitioner, I'm gonna go work for a company that's actually just doing this for consumers. 
maybe it gives you pause on that piece. Uh, and for any of you that are companies that are offering things direct to consumer that are not engaging uh, with uh, practitioners, uh, including those of you that just have a couple on your advisory board, go deeper. Let, let's, let's go deeper than that. So that would be my essential wrap up for today. Uh, and I'd love to welcome anyone forward if, if anybody has any questions. I know that we saw one that one question that could probably um, be uh, in an entire session. So I'll just pose that for, for my colleagues here. We might want to explore the, the power of wearables. Um, so this idea of what does the panel think about tech and health wearables? We all came you know, wearing our rings. Um, none of us are sponsored by Aura, by the way, uh, to track things like heart rate, sleep, menstrual cycles, and more useful or too much info for consumers. Um, Rachel, I'll, I'll start us off and then I'm gonna invite the panel. And then when you guys have said things, then I'll, I'll uh, invite Amanda, we can turn off our mics. Um, you know, I think one of the, the challenges that we have is the amount of data, uh, just having access to data does not actually help any of us get better. It's, it's actually knowing what to do with that data and what that data indicates. And so I think there's a, a varying degree and I'll highlight one thing for you. So Aura did a study recently uh, and the study came out and it, it showed how people did better with their, uh, got better sleep as it related to um, uh, using the Aura ring. The interesting thing was, in the study, they actually had the individuals meeting with uh, someone on a regular basis who gave them real-time input on what their results meant. That's the point in there. That's not what came out in the big broadcast of, if you wear this ring, look what can happen for you. It's if you wear this ring and you have someone who is looking at your data and can then help you with that, that's a bigger you know, win on that part. So I'll just open up to the panel for any of their questions as well, <coughs> or any of their comments on technology, on the wearables, et cetera. <coughs> Yeah, you know, I, I found a lot of utility in them uh, when working with clients. Again, my biggest my biggest challenge with them is just getting the data from their devices to me to help them navigate, you know, how to use it. But um, like I said earlier, the, um, you know, the data that we can get on like heart rate, heart rate variability, which is really interesting and has been studied for quite a while um, and is now being, you know, measured on a lot of these wearables. Uh, you know, menstrual cycle data and really empowering women to better understand what is going on with their body because the menstrual cycle has been described as the fifth vital sign. Uh, Lisa Hendricks Jackson really coined that and it's, it's, it's valid and, and um, a smart way to look at it. It can, for at least women, which is, is really my specialty, can reflect a lot back, um, you know, to, to the individual on their health. And but it does require, I mean, I think that's where this uh, question is getting at. I think it requires a lot of education on how to use the data, you know, effectively. And, and Aura does a good, or Ring, you know, I've looked at some of the, you know, they do do some, uh, a pretty good job on the educational blogs and, and complimentary information that they have. But the best case scenario that I see is, is having health, having a practitioner who understands how to use it, helping to guide and teach so that that individual can go and, and better utilize, you know, with the info that they're getting. I would just jump in and say, I think, again, with people, most- oh, Sorry, oh. because of time, I have to cut you. Oh. Is there okay. any one from the audience uh, uh, here? You want, uh, want, want, to, want to ask the last chance? Otherwise we can- Come to the on. mic. It's kind of exciting. You're here live. <laughs> <laughs> we won't bite. I have a question. Oh, great. Yeah. 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 <laughs> we can hear her too. So she's great. Thanks. Oh, sorry, thanks. Matt. Yeah. Hi, I'm Tasia. Um, so- yeah. So a lot of, um, from what I know, typically we see the, like, I guess the, what you guys offer. So like the clinical one-on-ones that you guys have, the testing, the aura rings, they are at a higher price point. Right. Um, so I guess my question is what are the steps that are being taken to make it more accessible to for college students, um, <laughs> people in lower classes. So how do we yeah. democratize personalized nutrition? Because none of us are here today to say personalized nutrition, the P stands for price tag. Like it's, it should not be a premium. This has to be accessible. And if there's anything we've learned from the pandemic, we all are interdependent on everybody else's health. So that is a huge one. I'm actually gonna start with Miles because that is an area that he has been uh, really focused on and, and from a career standpoint. So I'd love your thoughts on that, sure. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the things we've learned from the pandemic is there's a lot you can do in groups. There's a lot you can do online that makes everything much less expensive, like working with coaching groups around improving nutrition, around improving exercise. You can do exercise groups online with only one professional for 
hundreds of people instead of one on one. So I think a lot of it is utilizing that power of technology. And yeah, you're not going to get as precise as individualized if you don't do the test and that, but there's still a lot you can do by joining a group that has similar goals. A lot of what we do at my company, Vault Health, is we're very goal oriented. What are your goals? And that will identify 50% of what the specific recommendations for you would be would be geared towards. And yeah, the other 50% might be based on your genomics or on your microbiome or these other things, but you're halfway there. If you know, okay, my goal is body composition versus my goal is mental sharpness versus my goal is um, something about energy or sexual health or something, then you join groups that have coaches and nutritionists and trainers that are geared toward that goal. And I think a, 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 the, to conclude and, and where we need to go is also we really have to look at public health recommendations and realize that our recommendations for centuries now have been telling people what to do. The value of tools like this is they will show us things, but you can do you know, an example of instead of telling someone to eat the rainbow, if you have them do an assessment and they discover, oh, I'm not eating orange, we now have an action point, right? So we need to get into public health recommendations that are much more meeting someone where they are to Miles's point saying, what's your goal? But also let us show, let's have public health recommendations that are showing you and, and really helping you hack your way to better uh, recommendation, better outcomes on, on that part. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks to everyone for joining us. And thank you, Amanda, for being on Zoom. I know we had some sound uh, things in there. Uh, please feel free to both listen to the recording uh, on uh, YouTube, as well as to share it with others if you think there are people that would benefit from hearing more about this personalized nutrition. And we're really grateful you had us here today. Great. And great to have you guys and you know the, all the panelists here. And I think it's a great uh, dialogue today. And uh, thank you so much. Before we have, before we have to, you know, get people, some people ourselves, <laughs> we have yeah. to all use the, the auditorium. So, and thank you so much again. Uh, I will see you guys uh, next week. Yes, wonderful. Thanks everyone. Okay. Take care. Yeah. Bye. Thanks, Amanda.